Uh, today, I am going to be talking about the uh, six realms in the book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogyam Trumpa. But I want to begin with a brief review of some of the material that was in the uh, previous chapter, which was about the development of ego. What I realized after uh, I was done with that talk was that I really did not talk much about exactly what ego is. So uh, ego is looking at yourself as having something that is separate, solid, personal. Uh, in the uh, book, he talked about a grain of sand in a vast uh, barren land sticking its head up and saying, I am different. So uh, this is the characteristic of ego, feeling this solidity, uh, that it's separate, and it is somehow or another unchanging. I was once present when uh, Bharti Toko Rinpoche was asked, uh, uh, do we have a soul? And uh, Lama Yeshe Gamso was the translator. And so he translated the question into Tibetan. And then Bharti Rinpoche responded with, uh, uh, speaking in Tibetan, and then uh, Lama Yeshe responded in Tibetan too. And there's actually a number of back and forths like that. And finally, when Bharti Toko Rinpoche understood the question, uh, Lama Yeshe Gyamso turned to the man that asked it and said, no. So there is no soul. Uh, due to impermanence, everything is changing. Uh, therefore, the uh, ego is not solid. And due to interdependence, uh, it's not separate. And therefore, it's not personal. There is not a personal self or a personal ego. These five skandhas are used to explain the process on how we come to believe we have an ego. He used the word hallucinate, that we're deluded, we're hallucinating, that there is something solid, permanent, separate, and real. So the characteristics of ego is that it has territory and it has walls. And that it tries to bring the pleasant into its territory and try to kick out the unpleasant. And the ego, of course, is subject to the conflicting states of mind, that it feels attachment, a desire for the pleasurable, aversion, irritation, anger towards the unpleasant. And then there is indifference or denial, apathy, not caring. Frequently, it's just plain called stupidity. And then there's arrogance, thinking that you are better than other people. A man who uh, I met many, many years ago when I first began studying Buddhism told me this one time, kind of with a, a smile on his face. And that was, uh, I used to be proud that I wasn't arrogant. And that's how subtle ego is. And then there's jealousy when we think that we're not as good as another. All of this has to do with comparisons 
a watcher comparing oneself with another people, person. And all of this is not solid. It depends on what we're experiencing in the present. Uh, and uh, it varies and uh, something similar to what we have experienced in the past may be experienced with different intensity or totally different. Uh, what happens with ego is we get involved in the uh, uh, eight worldly concerns, which are uh, their opposites, pleasure, pain, gain and loss, fame and insignificance, praise and blame. We always go for the first of these two things and try to avoid uh, the second. Uh, there are five unrealistic expectations that uh, we with our ego have towards samsara. Uh, the first is that I'm the most important. Uh, let's say the most important person in the room, and I take this room with me wherever I go. Uh, that is this wall, which you separate ourselves from others and the rest of the world. The next is I should be respected just on the basis of who I am. Other people, on the other hand, have to earn my respect. The next is others should live up to my expectations. And in fact, if you're really my friend, I shouldn't even have to tell you what my expectations are. The next one, I should not be harmed in any way, whether it be physical harm, uh, waiting, uh, being caught in traffic at rush hour when I'm in a hurry. Uh, I should not be harmed by uh, buying a product that break and on and on and on. There's a limitless list of things that we consider harm us, slow us down, get in our way that are obstruct us and so forth. Keep us from being happy. And the last one is the world should be fair. And I'm the one who decides what is fair. And uh, underneath all of this is monkey mind, this uh, subconscious gossip. Uh, constantly going on and on and on. These are signs of ego. Now, I also talked about uh, the fabricated self or fabricated ego. And this is not in the book. This is from a teaching uh, by His Holiness, the uh, Karmapa, and it's in the Heart is Noble. And here he is uh, giving a talk to American college students and is uh, trying to keep things simple. But uh, first of all, uh, here fabricate has two meanings that seem very applicable to this fabricated self. Uh, one is to assemble from parts, which is what the five skandhas talk about. Skanda means heap. So five different heaps of stuff. And then the other meaning of fabricate is to fabricate a lie or fabricate evidence. So the way he explains this in terms of uh, a lifetime is that we were born and uh, we experience pleasure and pain when it's a pleasure that we're experiencing, the baby is smiling, maybe giggling. And when uh, the diapers need to be changed, the baby is crying. When the baby is hungry, the baby cries. So right off the bat, the baby can experience and determine the difference between pleasure and pain. 
And as the baby develops, so his awareness becomes, uh, grows, becomes more aware of things. Uh, he, he knows what it feels like to be comforted by his mother, helps him calm down. And maybe his parents tell him things about himself, like you're, you're a nice baby, or when the uh, child does something uh, wrong, it might say you're bad, and so forth. And as he grows up, he takes in more information from his environment and from those around him and gradually builds up an idea of who he is. This is the fabricated self that his friends at school will tell him things, the teachers will tell him things that uh, will be incorporated into this fabricated self. He'll see things on television, on social media, and so on and so forth. And on and on it goes. He keeps getting more information, more experiences, and this fabricated self becomes more and more uh, subtle. And then you can add into that karma from previous lives and habitual patterns from previous lives. And so in Western psychology, and this is not a complete list, but there is early childhood psychology, there is childhood psychology, there is adolescent psychology, there is adult psychology, there is psychology for people with midlife crises, there is geriatric psychology, and there's hospice psychology. So if there's something that is solid here and unchanging, uh, uh, even Western psychology have not been able to find it. So that is this fabricated self that I talked about. The point is that there's nothing solid there, it's nothing that is unique, nothing there that is permanent, that it comes from uh, the environment, the people that we come in contact with and other aspects of the environment. Finally, I talked about functional ego, and this is from a teaching of Kralig Rinpoche. And again, this is not in the book, but I wanted to clear this up. This is a person who is mostly free of attachment, aversion, and indifference or stupidity that here the person is motivated to get what needs to be done completed without the attachment aversion, uh, without comparing himself to other people and so forth. Just knowing how to pay the bills, fill up your car with gas, go to work, do whatever needs to be done to accomplish what you uh, need to do according to your vision. When obstacles arrive, you arise, you work with them skillfully, again, without these afflictive states of mind arising. Uh, we studied uh, the book In Love with the World by Mingyur Rinpoche, where he began his three-year retreat in India. Now, he lived in India without monetary support from outside for over three years, uh, mostly on the streets. So he was able to navigate that. He did what needed to be done to complete his retreat. Uh, but on the other hand, he was not uh, overcome by attachment, aversion, and indifference. So this is what I meant by a functional ego. What allows you to get by in the, this world of hallucinations by ordinary sentient beings. 
So now to get into the chapter titled The Six Realms. So this is an in-depth look at the six realms. Uh, they were covered briefly in the previous chapter. And uh, he continues using this monkey as an example. It starts out with the monkey being in the hell realm. Quote, the hallucinations of hell are generated from an environment of claustrophobia and aggression. There are lots of lots of different types of hell in Buddhism. Uh, there are the uh, hot hells and there are the cold hells. The hot hells are described uh, frequently as the ground is like burning lava. Uh, the rivers uh, are uh, rivers of acid and there are people in them that their bodies are being eaten up. Uh, there are people that are being attacked by demons, uh, stretched out and uh, cut up. There are uh, hells of uh, trees whose leaves are knives and swords and so forth. In other words, it is a horrific place and uh, there is tremendous aggression by the person in it. Uh, this is what creates it. Again, this is a delusion. This is a hallucination. So the monkey is making up this hell. He believes that it is real on the other hand, just as we believe that our experience and our environment is real. This is an important point that the monkey or any being in hell, they believe it to be just as real as the world that we live in. And both are hallucinations or like being in a dream. So there's this feeling of being trapped in a small space with uh, no room to move, no other possibility, no choice but to fight the walls. He says that uh, the monkey may even try suicide, but he can't even get away that way. Uh, because you'll just be reborn in hell. But he actually is just talking about one lifetime here. He doesn't even talk about being reborn. Uh, he just talks about going through these mental states in one lifetime. So since he can't even kill himself, the pain gets worse. And then uh, the monkey gets paralyzed with pain. As the pain gets worse and worse and worse. And so he finally gives up the struggle. Uh, that gets him into the freezing hells the ones with uh, ice, snow, no shelter, no relief. It's barren, desolate. And in this state, eventually the monkey becomes exhausted. And with that exhaustion, then he's not fighting so much. There's not so much aggression. Uh, the intensity of the experience decreases a little bit. He relaxes a little bit. And he starts to see the possibility of a more spacious view. Before there was no possibility of anything else. This is just the way it is. Now he has this possibility of relief from the suffering. And so he develops a, a great hunger, Trump Rinpoche says, a great hunger for a more uh, pleasurable, spacious circumstances. 
So now we're in the uh, hungry ghost realm or the preta realm. The monkey uh, fantasizes ways to satisfy his desires. On the other end, each fantasy ends with disappointment. But this doesn't stop him fantasizing. So he continues to make up endless fantasies of future satisfaction. And the pain here is this continual pain of not getting what he wants. Uh, Trump, remember, he says it's a love-hate relationship with his dreams. He loved to, loves to dream, but he hates the results. He's fascinated with his dreams. But as I said, he's repelled by them too because it's so painful. And this is interesting. He says, it's the insatiable hunger itself that causes the pain, not the finding what you want, uh, not finding what you want. The monkey in this uh, realm is fascinated with being hungry. And so this pain and hunger of the Prater realm, quote, and the preoccupation of the other realms provide the monkey with something exciting to occupy himself, something to make him feel secure that he exists as a real person. So this is something that goes throughout the, uh, the six realms, this preoccupation, this busyness, occupying himself, making himself secure. Kind of, if I'm busy, I must be okay. I must exist. That the monkey is afraid to give up this security and this entertainment. That uh, he just can't see the possibility of going beyond the walls and into open space. It's unknown and it's frightening. So then uh, he enters the animal realm, that he becomes both resentful and resigned. So he gives up the intensity of the hunger and just relies on habitual patterns. Uh, he relates to the world with habitual patterns. Uh, this alleviates the suffering somewhat. Uh, and uh, Rinpoche talks about this, uh, the pig symbolizing the animal realm. And uh, the pig in the wheel of life in the center, if you remember, there's a pig, snake, and a rooster. The pig, uh, in that case, symbolizes um, uh, ignorance, the emotion, ignorance, or indifference, or stupidity. And so that's what is being talked about here. That a, He says that a pig doesn't look to the right or the left. It just goes ahead and eats whatever is in front of it. So uh, that is the animal realm. Just In fact, the uh, Tibetan word for animal means one that goes hunched over. You know, not looking up, not looking around and just looking at whatever is in front of it. Uh, where I live, there are a lot of Asian beetles. They're an alien species, but uh, they really like uh, the insects that uh, eat soybean or you know, the plants of, that produce the soybeans. And so they were brought in to help control uh, a pest. And they get into the house in the fall, they're looking for a warm place to winter, 
for safety. And so they find places to get into the house and they fly around until they run into something and then they grab a hold of it. And if they land on something like a, uh, a, a cup, they will go round and round and round in circles on the cup because that's their habitual pattern. And I think they symbolize very well this animal realm mentality too. So now the next is the human realm. And uh, Rinpoche describes it as a realm of passion and intellect. That here we're using our intellect to maximize pre uh, pleasure and minimize pain. We're more discriminating. Uh, we see more alternatives, there's more space. But then hope and fear enters. We hope for certain things and then we're afraid that it's not going to happen or we're afraid something is going to happen, but we hope it won't. Uh, we're trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Uh, always thinking about how to possess pleasurable things. The monkey finds that he can't hold on to the pleasure. That even if he finds something pleasurable, it doesn't last and soon he is craving something else. And then he can't always get what he wants. And then there is the suffering of birth, old age, sickness, and death. So pain is a constant companion in the human realm, and uh, the human is aware of it. The occupant of the human realm is aware of this pain and trying to separate himself, and it's futile. So then we have the jealous God realm or the Azura realm that here the monkey develops the idea of a heaven. And Rinpoche says, uh, it would be uh, this dream of acquiring extreme wealth or power or fame. So they become obsessed with achievement and competition, constantly comparing themselves to other people struggling to attain uh, perfection, attain power over other people, attain more fame than other people have, uh, dream of ideal states. Uh, if you can develop a greater concentration and control of your thoughts, uh, you can be, you might say, more successful at acquiring wealth, power, and fame. But wanting to control causes hope and fear, anxiety. They increase. The monkey might lose his territory or not gain any more. Always there is this fighting, this aggression in the background hope of winning, fear of losing. It makes the monkey feel alive, that he exists. He's watching himself. But along with that is a sense of irritation. Quote, the monkey is caught in a world full of unfulfilled ideals, self-condemnation and fear of failure. He may achieve his goal, Rinpoche says. He might become rich, famous, or a leader of a company. Uh, gradually, he relaxes. And so this is entry into the full God realm. He, the term is uh, Deva Loka. So he dwells on his achievements and uh, uh, shields out undesirable things. He is, um, the monkey now is blissful and proud. 
quote, figuratively, the bodies of the gods are made out of light. That's important there, figuratively. So it's a kind of self-hypnosis, uh, a concentration that blocks out everything that is irritating uh, or undesirable. And uh, I will say this, that I have seen people meditate with uh, smiles on their face. So it is possible to, for a very brief period of time, uh, to meditate and go into this self-hypnosis and explain, uh, experience uh, bliss and block out everything else. So then comes the formless God realm. This uh, is the highest God realm. So he finds that through further concentration, uh, there are realms beyond sensual pleasures of the God realm. That this is the, uh, he says, the ultimate refinement of the six realms. It's all mental. That uh, the monkey maintains a solid self by expanding the walls to seemingly, quote unquote, include all of space. that uh, the monkey thinks he's gone beyond birth and death, that he watches, and that's an important word, watching. The watcher is very important to Trump and Rinpoche in this book and many of his teachings. So he watches limitless space. He's totally preoccupied with it. He creates it and he feeds on it. Then he focuses on limitless consciousness. And it's the same thing, he watches it. Quote, ego has become a huge, gigantic beast. It is territory so big, it can't be defined as this or that, end quote. So then the next step that ego goes is that it dwells on uh, not this and not that. And ego's pride grows. It uses it to maintain itself continuously. He can't put a label on it, so the ego uses not this and not that. So ego watches, measures, compares, and uh, Crumper and Pichet, this is the highest. Uh, samsaric state that mind can achieve. Uh, there is still is a self and other, and there are subtle walls. And there are concepts. So uh, all these fantasies of the of five skandhas are seen as real that the monkey is still hallucinating. He has to continually check to maintain his achievements. And uh, it's still a temporary state of egohood. Uh, now comes the downfall. So at some point, it all wears out and panic sets in. The monkey feels threatened. He feels confused, vulnerable. And uh, quickly he descends to the jealous God realm. But there the anxiety and the envy is too overpowering. So he goes to the human realm. And that's too overwhelming too for him. So he decides to space out, it's too much. So he escapes the hesitation and the critical uh, perspective and goes to the animal realm. 
But then uh, Trump and Rinpoche used the word nostalgia. Nostalgia for the God realm brings more desire. And now he's struggling in the uh, hungry ghost realm. And this unsatisfied desire brings more aggression, more frustration. The walls become closer. As he descends, the walls get closer and closer and closer. And now he's back in the hell realm, uh, full of heat and claustrophobia. Quote, this perpetual cycle of struggle, achievement, disillusionment, and pain is the circle of samsara the karmic chain reaction of dualistic fixation. So again, no birth or death is mentioned in this. This is purely psychological. That uh, if we really look deeply at our minds and what emotions we are feeling, that we, uh, we visit all these realms and this is my own interpretation that we seem to specialize in one and have a competency in another if we were to uh, draw up a resume. So the human realm has the possibility of breaking this karmic chain and escaping. It's the human realm is the most desirable realm if we are looking to escape that here there is a possibility of questioning, of examining, contemplating, and practicing. That we have, uh, all of us have the possibility to do this. Uh, that we need panoramic awareness and transcendent, transcendental knowledge to be able to do this. So, Panoramic awareness, Trump or MPJ, frequently talks about an aerial view. Having a, uh, a broad lens uh, from above, perhaps a drone, if you would like. So we can see the, uh, the bigger picture. And he says it takes a certain uh, view that sees the irony and has a humorous quality. That the monkey it fully experiences the, tr the struggle and sees that it is futility. The monkey laughs at his hallucinations and gives up fighting with the wall. At that point, he finds them warm, soft, and penetrable. He says the monkey at that point can walk through the walls of the house. And the last quote here is, that is why compassion is described as, quote, soft and noble heart, end quote. It is a communication process that is soft, open, and warm. So this is where we want to go, the direction we want to go in to drop the struggle, see the futility of the struggle with the walls, to laugh at our hallucinations and uh, find the walls soft and penetrable, communicate with the walls. There are some questions here, not many. The first one is, I don't struggle with the walls. I see them as protection. The answer is the more you dislike the walls, the stronger and thicker they will get. Make friends with the walls and they weaken and disappear, even if you want them for protection. So make friends with the walls. Second question is, are pain and pleasure similar to good and bad? And he says they come from the same background, that they are judgments, they are conceptual. 
he says, if you can see the absurdity of trying to achieve pleasure and rejecting pain, that here the humor is, um, is important. The last question is, everything manifests from emptiness. What is there to break out of? And the answer is, well, from ego's point of view, the phenomenal world is very real and solid and overwhelming. They are real hallucinations to us samsaric beings. That uh, these hallucin hallucinations, uh, even our thoughts are real. That, uh, that the, the person doesn't even allow another point of view. I'm too busy trying to prove uh, that I exist and am solid. So there's no gaps or room for inspiration. Quote, you have to see the confused aspect uh, completely in order to see through it, to see the absurdity of it. So I, um, before I open it up to questions and answers, I have a story to tell. And that is that a few chapters ago, the chapter about humor, he talked about the a man in the cave that had a large lump of turquoise on his altar and it, a mouse got interested in it and tried to take it. And eventually it took eight mice to take it away, but they succeeded. And of course, the meditator laughed at the irony of all of this as the mice had no use for this tur turquoise. Well, in our uh, Hay River KTC shrine room, we occasionally get mice. And so I filled the uh, offering bowls with the semi-precious jewels used in mandala practice so that the mice wouldn't empty them. Well, one day I went in there and uh, there was a lot of these jewels gone, uh, most likely by a mouse or two. Uh, and a couple of days ago, I was doing a solitary retreat in there and I picked up a box of Kleenex and it was surprisingly heavy. I emptied it out and there was a cup and a half of semi-precious jewels that a mouse or mice worked very hard to put in there. And uh, I think this is a very good lesson. Not only is it humorous, but uh, to investigate our own lives and how often do we chase after shiny things or what we think are pretty or desirable or whatever that really have little or no use that we're just keeping ourselves busy and entertained and so forth. The question is, do you think the mice were setting up their own shrine and making an offering? I doubt if a mouse had that level of intelligence. Um, on my Facebook page, people, it was a very uh, lot of comments, many, many comments. And some of them went that direction. Personally, you could say that that mouse was stealing from the Sangha. And uh, I don't know if a mouse or an animal can steal from the Sangha. Uh, and maybe that mouse created some good karma. I don't know. But I don't think this was something that was in the mouse's mind. I think it was just uh, as in the story, uh, a mouse becoming attached to something that it had no use for and worked very hard to collect that much of these semi-precious jewels no doubt in his mouth, he didn't have a uh, fanny pack. 
he had to make many, many trips, spend a lot of time. Uh, and then uh, they ended up in my Kleenex box and uh, the mouse either died or forgot about it. So I would say there was a lot of wasted time. And again, it's good to look at our own activities and prioritize and see what's important and what is not so important and spend our time doing things that are important rather than just go about busily trying to um, uh, keep ourselves occupied. To go down this road a little bit further, now I'm 76 years old and when I first moved out here in 1971, this was before the internet, this was before cell phones, this was for, before answering machines. Uh, and I had a group of friends and um, if I wanted to see somebody frequently, I would just drive over because I knew they'd be home. And the same thing uh, with me, they knew when I was home and they would just come. And then life got busier. I remember answering machines when they first came in and someone told me, it just makes me angry when I get an answering machine instead of a live person. And uh, now uh, we rely on an answering machine. And uh, you want to go see somebody? Well, you better contact them first before you go over because A, they might not be there and B, they might be too busy. And on and on and on. And it's like, how busy can you be to fill up to... Uh, it just on and on and on. It seems to be going faster and faster and faster. And it really is important to uh, take a time out, look at your life, and maybe try to be content more with less. Uh, there were two comments here. One was about the Kleenex box with a jewel in them. And it was, that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, or rather, I think it was, that's something to sneeze at. And then the other one is that the amount of time that you spend on, in certain areas is an indication of your attachment. And I think that's a very good observation. Uh, the question is, uh, does a mouse or an ant or any other animal have the same type of mind as uh, we humans? Is it one mind? What is it? And so if it was one mind, when the Buddha became enlightened, we'd all be enlightened. But mind has it's beyond the material world. So it has no size. And uh, so is it one mind? That's the next step. And uh, so the first one was from the uh, relative point of view. So is it one mind from the ultimate point of view? And uh, the answer is that it's not two. So to go back from the relative point of view, everybody thinks that they are different and separate and we put up walls. And, uh, but the ultimate nature of that mind is not two that we have Buddha potential, we have the potential to become a completely enlightened being and so forth, but we confused, hallucinating, sentient beings don't see it. And this is why we could be reborn an animal, an actual animal, or we could be reborn in the hell realm. Again, all of this depends on our karma, 
the collection of our actions, good and bad. We could be reborn in uh, a, a God realm. The follow-up is if uh, we have Buddha nature, does an ant have Buddha nature? And the question or the answer is yes, that even a microbe uh, is sentient, can distinguish between happiness and suffering. And if it's possible to move, it will move away from what it considers a, a potential danger. And so uh, a sentient being can be quite small. The Buddha, when he was alive, he had his students strain water before they drank it so that they would not drink and kill sentient beings. Uh, as one Tibetan said, uh, but we don't have to worry about that because we have the city uh, water system kill the, the beings before they get to us. So the question is, if you're drinking city water, then and they are killing off organisms in the water before it gets to you, uh, is this the same as hiring a hitman? And it is not because you do not have the intention to kill these animals and you do not rejoice in these beings being killed. So that is the difference. What makes the karma most severe is the intention to do the deed, the actual doing of the deed, thought, word, or uh, your bodily actions, and then rejoicing in it. Mm -hmm. So if it's just, it's happening, you don't have the intention and you're not rejoicing in it, then it's much, much, much less severe. And actually, in a way, it's not much different than driving down a country road in the summertime with all the bugs on the windshield. It would be good, of course, if you wanted to, to dedicate merit to these beings from time to time. <laughs>